we examine your word. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Table Church. My name is Trevor Zielinski. Um, my wife and, and I have been attending Table Church for about three years now. Um, so uh, I serve on the production team um, up in the booth and um, setting up in the mornings. And so um, it's just a joy to be here and a joy to, to worship with all of you this morning. I'm going to read um, scripture this morning. We're going to read um, from the short little um, letter from Paul, um, Philemon, uh, verses 8 through 16. Therefore, although in Christ, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Jesus Christ, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated for you, from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. All right, so we'll be looking at Philemon today, as you just heard. If you have a Bible, be sure to open it there. Um, if you don't have a Bible and you'd like one, we have Bibles. Raise your hand and somebody will bring you one. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure, sure, sure who right now, but somebody, I promise, will bring you a Bible. Uh, but if you don't own a Bible, you're free to keep the one that we give you as well. It's our gift to you. We're just glad that you're here today. Hey, I want to reiterate real quick what Pastor Megan said earlier about our uh, Christmas open house. It's going to be potluck style, but you know, potlucks are, are not very fun if no one brings anything. Uh, so be sure to sign up, it's write on your connection card, circle one thing or put open house or whatever the case is, and we'll send you a link to the sign up sheet uh, so that we are sure to do a church potluck the way it ought to be done, right? We're table church. We can't mess up a potluck, right? <laughs> uh, so be sure to let us know and we will get you the information you need. So like I said, we're looking at Philemon today. It's this tiny little letter. It's just one page, one chapter. In fact, we don't even... It's, it's funny, like if you're looking up a verse in Philemon, there's no chapter, it's just the verses, because there's only one chapter. And so we're going to be looking at that letter today. This was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians in the city of Colossae, uh, who their leader was uh, evidently Philemon, but if you read the introduction to the letter, he does name a few other Christians, and so he's writing it to a, a small group of people. Uh, but in particular, he's writing to a guy named Philemon. Now, we know that uh, Philemon was a dear friend of Paul's. We don't know exactly how they met, but I imagine that Paul probably discipled him, maybe led him to Christ. And so they're dear friends. We also can tell that Philemon's apparently a wealthy guy. Why do we know this? Well, because he runs a household and he's got slaves in his household. We know this because the letter is about one of those slaves named Onesimus. Now, things had apparently gone terribly wrong between Philemon and Onesimus. In fact, Onesimus ran away from Philemon. And as best we can tell, our, our guess is that he made an 80-mile journey to the city of Ephesus, where Paul was imprisoned, where he met up with Paul and spent some time with Paul. Now, um, Apparently, things went well with Paul because, as you can tell from the letter, Paul writes very tenderly about this probably young boy, probably a teenage boy named Onesimus. And, and it's, it's, it's likely that Onesimus ran to Paul on purpose, like things went bad between him and Philemon. So he thinks, well, maybe Paul can mediate between us. I've heard him talk about this guy, Paul. Maybe he's met him before. He's like, Paul's a good guy. I'm going to go to him and see if he'll help me out. And so he spends some time with Paul, and Paul writes a letter to his master, Philemon, and sends Onesimus back to his master with that letter in his hand. And what's kind of amazing is that somehow, 2,000 years later, we still have that little letter. Somehow it got preserved all those decades, made it into the Bible, and now today we're talking about it 2,000 years later. We're going to talk a little bit more later about how that might have happened, 
about why we have this little kind of personal document, uh, but we'll get there in due time. But what we have here is we have a runaway slave. And in the ancient world, that person's in a real tight spot. There's no telling what the consequences are going to be uh, if he's caught. In fact, the consequences could be any number of punishments, including death. I'll be really hoping that Paul's going to step in on his behalf. And so what this means is that when we read Philemon is that we're about to find out if the gospel is worth anything. Like, we're going to find out, does this stuff that these Christians talk about and say they believe, does it actually change anything? Here we have a real live conflict, and we're about to see if the gospel can have anything to say to that conflict. Will it change the culture? Or will Paul and Philemon act the same way we would expect any other Roman slave owner to act? Now, any of our faith, kind of, we're, we're, we're reflecting on the uh, scriptural and theological Titanic Ocean to our country. And notice that this is right in the heart of our nation's battle over slavery. This is six years before the Civil War. And so imagine that, that kind of, um, I don't know, that world at that time, and you can kind of see how explosive this lyric may have been at the time. Here's what it says. It says, chains shall he break for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. So that line is explosive when you situate it in that time of history, isn't it? And no doubt that line was inspired by Philemon, particularly verses 15 and 16. It says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother, it says. Now, to get an idea of how revolutionary that verse is, those two verses we just read, we're going to compare the letter of Philemon to another letter that was written around the same time in history. It was written by a guy that we call Pliny the Younger. And there was a guy who was also named Pliny the Older. That was the Younger's uncle. Uh, but this one was written by Pliny the Younger. And it was written to his friend named Sabinianus. Now, Pliny was a statesman. He was in the Senate in Rome. He was an important guy. And he's writing this letter to Sabinianus, who apparently was a wealthy guy too. In fact, the fact that he had a slave in the first place means that he was a pretty wealthy guy. Now, there's many similarities between the letter to Philemon and the letter to Sabinianus. Uh, so what you have here is in both letters, a slave runs away from the master, makes their way to their master's friend, Paul and Pliny. And both of these guys send the slaves back to their masters with a letter, the letter of Philemon and the letter to Sabinianus. And so what else is interesting is that both of these letters encourage the slave owners to take their slaves back, the runaway slave back. And so all sorts of parallels, they're about the same length even, all sorts of parallels and similarities. However, there is one very important difference, and it's this. Pliny sees the slave as a means to an end, but Paul sees Onesimus as a brother. Listen carefully to the words that Pliny writes to Sabinianus, and I'll unpack them as soon as I'm done here. He says, he, here's what he writes in that letter. He says, you have a right to be angry, but mercy earns most praise when anger is fully justified. Once you loved this fellow, and I hope you will love him again, for the moment it's enough if you let yourself be placated or calmed. You can always be angry again if he deserves it, and you'll have all the more reason if you've been placated now. So here's what he just said. Pliny says, Sabinianus, you should take him back. Why? You have every right to be angry, but you know what? He says, mercy earns most praise when anger is fully justified. In other words, Sabinianus, take him back because it's going to make you look good. Like people are going to see you and they're going to say, wow, Sabinianus just took that runaway slave back into his home. What a virtuous man. It's going to make you look good, Sabinianus. 
And you know, you got nothing to lose. I mean, if the slave makes you mad again, then you can kick him out. And you still look good. They're like, everyone's going to be like, well, he gave him a second chance. It's his fault, right? You're just going to look better for this, Sabinianus. It's a business decision for Pliny and Sabinianus. They don't even name the slave. We don't know his name. But Paul names Onesimus. The slave was a means to an end. Taking him back was simply to make Sabinianus look better for his neighbors, to earn him more honor. There's nothing about reconciliation here, nothing about true forgiveness. It's a business decision. Now, compare that to Paul's words to Philemon. I'll read it once again, 15 and 16. It says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother, he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. You see what's going on here? It's a revolution. Paul isn't talking about what Philemon might get out of this. Paul identifies an inherent dignity in this young slave. Paul sees something in him that is outside of anything Philemon or Paul can assign him. This this slave has a value to Paul that nothing can take away. He's talking about what he writes in 2 Corinthians 5 where he says, God gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul is inviting Philemon to step into the kingdom of God where, as he writes in Galatians, there's neither slave nor free, he says. He's he's beckoning Philemon into a whole different reality, completely different than the Roman Empire, than the way that things worked back then. He's pointing us to something else he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5. He says there that if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. See, Paul is saying, look, the old order of things is irrelevant The way of Pliny and Sabinianus is over. There is a new world breaking into this one. Philemon, it's time to get in step with that new world. Behold, your brother, Onesimus. This points us to the radical new world that Paul is proclaiming. N.T. Wright, Bible scholar, says that if Philemon was the only book of the New Testament we had, just that one little page that we call Philemon, if that's all we had, he said that would be enough for us to know that something big happened 2,000 years ago. Something unprecedented. The moral framework of humans, of a small group of humans, completely shifted, seemingly out of nowhere, and with no precedent. It makes no sense. Paul says things here that just don't fit with his time or culture. And what this does is it focuses us on something that we often overlook at Christmas, in the middle of our presents and hot chocolate you know what we forget? We forget Christmas is a revolution. That when Jesus came into the world, something changed. Something big went down. Now, what's a, a revolution? A revolution is an overthrowing of the reigning power. And notice, when you read the Bible, you'll notice this. That's exactly what Mary seemed to think when the angel appeared to her and announced that she's going to give birth to a son. She sings this song. We call it the Magnificat. And in this song, here's what she says. She says, he has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble. People like Onesimus, God is lifting up, she's saying. That's a revolution. Early Christians, this is what they were doing when they declared that Jesus is Lord. What they're saying is Caesar is not our Lord. A peasant from backwater corner of Galilee, that's our Lord. It's a revolution. It's what happens when when Paul is firing a missile into the heart of Roman culture and their oppressive hierarchy in this tiny little letter to Philemon. Here's what I want to communicate today. It's this. We need a Christmas that's less cozy and more revolutionary. Every Christmas, me and probably most preachers, we, we issue this challenge, right? Like against being lulled simply into the commercialized Christmas that's more about cocoa and presents and, you know, all that stuff, rather than the overthrow of darkness and the reconciliation of all things. Like, that's what we're talking about here at Christmas. It's about breaking chains. (laughs) 
not getting large corporations into the black. That's not what we're supposed to be doing, focusing on here. What will save us is to actually read the text of the Christmas story. And when we read it, what we discover is uh, power-hungry rulers, people fleeing for their lives, and a story of good news about a savior who's come for the oppressed and for the poor and for the hurting, but we've, he's come to, to vanquish evil. Like it's a gospel with teeth in it, you know, but we've domesticated it and we put it in a department store window. And so every Christmas, we've got to remember what it's all about. We've got to remind ourselves. So I'm going to get sucked back into this. And I like to distinguish Christmas in, in, in two ways. I describe it in two different ways, and, and we need both of these. But the first way we can think of Christmas is what I call Christmas from above. Christmas from above, that's the cosmic story of Christmas. This is God crossing space and time to become a man in order to save the universe and reconcile all of us to him. And we need that, you know? It, it, like people are riding donkeys and shepherds are trying to scrape a living by and there's a little baby messiah problems. So that's Christmas. That's the gospel from above. But we also got to have something to say to people whose furnace just broke and they've got a terrible landlord who's still going to raise their rent and not fix their furnace. Have something to say to refugees who just got displaced from their homes and now they got to survive an Iowa winter. That's the gospel from below. It's not enough to just say, good news, God loves you, buddy, chin up. That doesn't fix the furnace. We need the gospel from below, too. We need Christmas from below. And it seems to me like the Bible writers believe that the gospel has something to say to people with their backs up against the wall, people like Onesimus. It's got some life. The Bible seems to say, look, if you, if you don't have one, you don't have either. It might be the case that Paul did directly condemn slavery <laughs> in the New Testament. But it's true. We wish that he was a little bit more severe on this stuff. Like, why, why send Onesimus back to his master? Why not just say, hey, you know, Philemon, sorry, man, Onesimus, he's free now, right? That's not what he does. However, what we do find in the New Testament is we find a moral vision that is unprecedented and for the first time in human history leads us unavoidably to the conclusion that slavery is wrong. And it's, and it's expressed in songs like, Oh Holy Night. You cannot write that line, Change shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. That, that's the result of reading a book like Philemon. And, and so when you read Paul's words here, like an institution like slavery cannot stand under the weight of that gospel truth. At some point it will crumble, and it did. Now, the question arises, what happened between Onesimus and Philemon after Paul sends him back with the letter? Like, you can about imagine this scenario, right? Like, <laughs> guess who shows up at the door? There's Onesimus. Oh, look who's come back, you know? And he produces this letter from Paul, and it was probably read aloud because it was written to more than just Philemon. And so it's read aloud. And you know, if you read the, the, the letter, it's kind of personal. And you got Paul kind of taking a little bit of a hard line sometimes, it feels like. Like he's basically saying to Philemon, look, I could tell you what to do. I could pull rank on you. I'm not going to do that. What does he say at the very beginning? He says, verse 8, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. What he's saying here is like, dude, I'm an apostle, like, I led you to the Lord. I could just tell you to do this, but I'm not going to do it. Instead, I, I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. So he's saying, look, man, bro, like, let's level here. I love you. And I love Onesimus. And I think, man, we don't actually know as to what might have happened. 50 years after Philemon was written, there's another early to the Christians in Ephesus. Now, it's probably the city where Philemon was written in. And so Ignatius is writing a letter to the Christians in Ephesus. And in this letter, he goes on and on when he was leading the Christians in the city of Ephesus in the book of Philemon. That this young slave boy 
who had run away and come back with this letter, had grown, and, and not only that, but he had been freed and that he had eventually become one of the bishops over all the Christians in the city. If that's the case, that would be a remarkable thing. That would be unheard of in the ancient world. In Ephesus, he uses the same language that Paul uses in the book of Philemon, and he does not use that language anywhere else in all of his writings, except for in that little section where he's talking about some bishop named Onesimus. Then that's something. What that means is that we have proof of a revolution. It's the only explanation as to how a slave in the ancient Roman world could become a bishop. Because something went down that completely changed the moral fabric of a tiny little group of people called Christ followers. And it also would explain a couple other things. Uh, best we can tell, the early Christians started to collect Paul's letters in order to formulate an early version of what we call the New Testament. So they started to collect these letters in the city of Ephesus. And if Ephesus was one of the centers, one of the locations where we first started to collect Paul's letters together, then no doubt the bishop of Ephesus would have had something to do with that. In fact, he might have been the one doing it. And it could very well be that this old man in his 70s or whatever, as he's bringing together these letters of Paul, pulls out an old, decades old, old tooth he cherished all those years. It really is a marvel that we have this little book about a rather personal matter. When in fact, Paul wrote a whole other letter to the Corinthians. There's a third Corinthians that we don't have. That he references it in his letters, but we don't have it. And yet we have Philemon. Isn't that something? And so today, I just hope that you'll remember that you're part of a revolution. Christmas is a revolution. Something changed when God entered the world at Christmas. And it still can change the world. And it starts by making Christmas a little bit less about consumption and more about worship. I'll put it this way. Make Christmas less about presence and more about presence. Less about presence and more about presence. We're talking about God coming into our world in order to redeem it, and that's a big deal. So you've, many of us have gone through countless Christmases. Maybe you've never really observed Christmas in the sense that it really is. It's a revolution. Maybe you've never really made it about Jesus before, who he is and what he was born to do. And so I invite you to change that today. Decide to follow Jesus today. And if you don't follow Jesus, please let us know. There's a cross on your connection card. You can circle that. And we will get in touch with you about what it means to take those first initial steps of faith. We would love nothing more than to be able to do that with you. But I also want to remind you of something that we do. And this is something that has become a tradition at Table Church, and it's that we give away our entire Christmas Eve offering. So we'll take an offering in our Christmas Eve service, um, and, and we'll give the whole thing away. And I want to tell you who we're going to give it to this year, and I actually feel kind of bad that I've never, I don't think I've ever mentioned this organization from the pulpit when actually Table Church wouldn't exist without them. So Table Church launched in 2019, and I was on staff, and so was Pastor Megan. We were on staff at a church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota called The Ransom, and in the last year or so of us being there, the Ransom started an organization that was going to help launch church plants called the Awakened Church Planting Network. And so we were part of the ground level of the Awakened Church Planting Network. And in fact, you are attending the very first Awakened Church Plant. We were the pioneer church plant of the Awakened Network. In the last four years, Awaken has now launched 13 more churches from Seattle to South Carolina. Uh, they've got two more coming in 2024, and they got five church planters currently in the hopper being trained in order to be launched out. And so it's really cool to see what God has done um, through this, this young organization that we are actually a part of. I'm on a Zoom call every month with the other pastors and church planters. Uh, and, and so we're going to give our offering to the Awaken Network in order to kind of do our part to say, number one, thanks for what you've done for us. But number two, we want to be a part of planting new churches as well going forward and just seeing people set free, seeing lives changed by the gospel all across this country. And so I say that to you right now, not only to tell you about the Awaken Network, and hopefully we'll have some more information about that by Christmas Eve, but also this way you can be planning about maybe what you want to give on that day. All right, would you pray with me?
Well, Lord Jesus, thank you for the fact that you break chains.